Hi viewers, today we are going to interview Dr. Ganesh Devraj, founder and CEO of Soliton Technologies. Soliton is technology based company focusing on R&D services. It's entering in 15th year of entrepreneurial journey in 2013. At present, Soliton has approximately 125 employees and their services include test and measurement automation, design of custom cameras, complete embedded product development. Soliton is a group of individuals who share a strong belief in the values of integrity and excellence. Some of its prestigious customers are General Electric, IBM, Boeing, Robert Bosch, Volvo and Texas Instruments. In these 15 years of span, Soliton has won 23 awards so far at the NI Week Best Application Contest. And the amazing part is, Soliton has set a record by winning the NI Week Global Contest three times in five years. Now, we will look at Soliton Technologies in the eyes of Dr. Ganesh Devaraj. So, Ganesh, what were the uncertainties you had uh, when you started Soliton? I really didn't feel any uh, uncertainty, you know, while I was uh, getting the company off the ground. Uh, we did have trouble finding business in the beginning, uh, but, you know, uh, it never got to a stage where I felt concerned about the ability to continue uh, running the company. Uh, and uh, so we were able to go through that initial phase without any, uh, uh, without any situations where I had to feel like, okay, I had to, you know, scale down. We had only three engineers and myself. Uh, so we never came to a situation where we uh, felt threatened about uh, having to even, even scale down the company at that point. So uh, had enough uh, capital support to keep it going uh, for at least seven months, I think, after the first project, another four months without uh, projects. And then uh, we then started getting projects and we were able to go from there. During uh, Solitan's uh, initial stage, um, what kind of people do you want to work with and uh, also how can you find them? Okay, yeah, so this, uh, uh, the answer to this actually really comes from again from the book I mentioned, Built to Last. Uh, so one of the key things they said in that book is, uh, you know, you said the, the, the company is only as good as the quality of its people. And it's really the, uh, so, you know, it really made a lot of sense to me. And I said, you know, if I want to build a company like a HP or a Sony, uh, you know, I need to go to India and find the very best people that I can find. So at that point, you know, I felt uh, Indian Institute of Science uh, master's program, I thought would probably be the best uh, to go and recruit from. And, uh, you know, with my, uh, you know, those years of, uh, you know, optimism, I never again doubted that, I would be able to find somebody, you know, high caliber person to join me. So I just went there with a lot of confidence to go and, uh, you know, try and uh, recruit out of IAC. Uh, actually ran a campus recruitment exercise. Uh, we got, uh, in fact, uh, I, I recall uh, quite a sizable number of people came for the uh, pre-placement talk, at, you know, and uh, I think of that quite a, quite a number actually took our recruitment test. Uh, and at this time, if you remember, you, know, you have to remember that I had not even started the company because this was a few months before I started the company, I came to India to drop off uh, my family. And at that time I went and said, you know, let me, uh, you know, try and have some people ready by the time I come back, uh, you know, end of that year. Uh, so I think it was in October, I came to IISC and I uh, recruited from there. And uh, I recruited two people and uh, had one more on standby. And then I came, I went back to US, finished my work with my uh, company in Michigan and then came back end of December and, you know, uh, I was waiting for them to join me. And then I, at the last moment, uh, when I was trying to follow up with them to find out, you know, uh, whether I need to help them with housing and Coimbatore and all that, they told me that uh, they both wrote very identical mails saying, due to unavoidable circumstances, I cannot join, join you, <laughs> right? And it was a very big shock to me because I had not heard anything until that point and I fully, you know, assumed that they would be joining, uh, you know, as per the commitment at the beginning of January. And then I scrambled to find another person. I went back to IIC because I had one more person in that list. At that time, I didn't want to hire more than two. Uh, so he was still doing his master's thesis and he was only graduating in February. I found him, I convinced him to join us, join Sar Saraton and then 
uh, I came back and then I was trying to find at least one more person in uh, Coimbatore. Uh, so then I went to CIT uh, college, uh, again uh, I went to the master's program, I talked to a lot of faculty there and uh, the faculty, one of the faculty f took a lot of interest in the work that we were doing because it was quite different from the standard you know, IT services that uh, other companies were doing. Uh, we were working with instruments, automation. So he recommended one of his top students uh, to Soliton saying he's already placed in uh, Tata Consultancy Services, but you know, I convinced him to come and talk to you. So then I met this person and then uh, he took a lot of convincing, but uh, he was very ambitious chap and he felt maybe he's working in a small company at the starting stage uh, would give him more exposure than going into a large company like TCS. Uh, so he also joined. Uh, so it was essentially the two of them and then I found one more person on uh, a contract uh, that is, I knew somebody in Coimbatore who uh, uh, who recommended this person saying, I don't have any projects for him, uh, you, you know, he can come to you on contract. So it was really these uh, three people that I started with. But what I found very interesting was, uh, the person from IIC, he had a lot of caliber, uh, you know, he had a lot more exposure than the two people from Coimbatore. In fact, the second person from Coimbatore, uh, he had not, uh, he had not even done a master's, he had done and uh, a BSc degree, a three year BS Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science. And uh, you know, typically, you know, you would not think that a person, you know, who has not done an engineering degree, somebody who has gone into this, say, uh, a BSc degree, may not be high caliber, but to my surprise, uh, he and the master's student from CIT were far outperforming the uh, student from IIC, the graduate from IIC rather. And uh, it took me only a little while, probably two, three weeks to understand what was going on. Uh, for these two people, uh, their entire focus was on, you know, learning uh, and they were putting their heart and soul into, you know, uh, doing their best possible work. Uh, whereas the guy from IIC, he had come there and he was looking at the setup with, you know, only two, three people. He, of course, he knew that he was joining a startup, but I think he still had in his mind a lot of worries. Is this the right company for me? you know, my, this friend is in uh, so and so, this other friend has gone here, you know, they're all in big companies and I am, uh, so all these distractions really caused him to uh, not be, be able to focus on his work as much and uh, I really found that his performance was lagging a lot. So that's when I realized that it is not purely the caliber of the person that makes the difference, but it's their, uh, their attitude that they bring to work, you know, how fiercely they want to do a good job really determines, uh, of course, there's a there's a minimum standard and caliber. I mean, we set a high bar there for sure. Uh, we were not hiring just about anybody. Uh, but above the threshold uh, of uh, caliber, it really was not about their innate abilities, but it really came down to uh, what kind of hunger and passion they had, uh, you know, to, to the work that they were doing. And uh, from that point onwards, I realized that, you know, I should be looking more for uh, you know, this uh, passion in the person, uh, setting a high ba bar on caliber, of course, uh, but, you know, more importantly, after that, you know, somebody crosses that bar, I was looking for that passion in them and uh, the attitude that they carry to work. And uh, that is, I feel, really served, you know, Soliton well over the many, many years uh, that we have kind of uh, worked on the same formula, kept refining the same thing, saying that it's more important to find the uh, very passionate people uh, rather than uh, just looking at their academic, uh, you know, degrees and things like that. Uh, Ganesh, one question. So your uh, idea of an ideal employee changed over a period of time. So did it actually change once or uh, did it change for a number of times? Uh, interestingly, it changed only once, uh, Sriram. I felt, you know, that one experience uh, really, uh, you know, told me much. But of course, uh, the other thing that I feel I've added on uh, you know, uh, to the skill set that I've been looking for more recent years is communication skills. In the early years, I knew that people with good communication skills were hired by the uh, multinational companies. And uh, I felt that, you know, uh, there will be some very high caliber people with a lot of passion. What I thought, you know, uh, the, I will look for people, even if they don't have very strong communication skills, uh, I will look for them because they will be able to do the technical work very well. Uh, but what I've realized is that, uh, you know, after the first year or two, uh, 
communication skills become really important i i would say all the way from the start but uh, you know definitely as they go higher up and they have to start interacting with customers they have to start interacting with other team members you know their ability to communicate uh, really i found out that uh, it's very crucial so i would say i added that as a criteria uh, you know uh, maybe about 3 4 years after i started so this first lesson came to me you know within the first two months and then i would say this second uh, criteria i would say you know i added about 3 uh, years 3 4 years later so after that i think it's really not changed very much uh, it's been pretty much uh, the same after that so ganesh you told it took around 7 8 months to get your first uh, project so can you tell more about your first project uh, how easy it was to convince your first customer and uh, how it was when you had to get your first customer outside your contacts good question uh, shriram in fact uh, my very first customer was my uh, employer from michigan uh, my past employer right so when i came back from uh, the us uh, i convinced them to you know send a project to us uh you know so i actually came uh, with a project in hand and we spent the first 3 4 months uh, working on that project and uh, we delivered it it was a successful project we were one month late uh, there were other reasons why that happened uh, but uh, you know the project itself was a good success we got very good feedback from the customer that was uh, chrysler corporation uh, in michigan it was done through my past employer uh, but we handled the project entirely you know and uh, installation also i went to the us to do it uh but uh, soon after that project they actually detroit actually has this very cyclical uh you know business uh, periods it will be high and then sometimes it will be very low and uh, our uh, by the time we finished the project the timing was such that you know it went to a big low so uh, there was almost for another full year there were no projects from uh, my past employer vi engineering so that's the time i had to start looking for uh, projects in india and uh, you know and that's the time i would say it took another 4 months i would say where we i kept going to various companies and uh, i had a lot of contacts uh, in coimbatore because my father was quite well connected to many uh, business people in coimbatore some of them running the type of factories uh, where they could use automation so through his references i was able to meet all of them and make the presentations so i was able to go with credibility but the big challenge was they were all not using automation at that point and uh, so for them to start spending money on this kind of automation was very new and uh, so while they showed interest by the time we turned in a proposal showed them what costs were involved uh, you know nobody none of them actually uh, really uh, came forward to give us a project and uh, so the first project i would say that after that uh, the one from vi engineering uh, came from prikal in uh, coimbatore it's a large automotive component manufacturer uh, they make uh, dashboard instruments uh, they had imported a machine from uh, japan and uh, that okay. that machine was an automation system uh, for to automate the speedometer calibration uh, and it was not working in their production line so since they had just spent money on it and they found that you know this was not working and i gave this presentation saying you know we can use computers and uh, build automation systems they showed a, they didn't show me the machine they just gave me the requirements and said uh, can you meet the same requirement for automation can you give us a proposal so i actually gave them a proposal uh, that first that customer uh, you know who gave us the project uh, they gave it to us because you know they thought okay here is something that's not working what we just imported let's see if these guys can build us something and uh, they gave us a lot of uh, requirements and it was very interesting we were able to show a proof of concept in just one month and uh, that really uh, impressed them very greatly because they never imagined that we could build the, you know that much a capability in one month i definitely have to uh, you know thank national instruments and their tools labview and their uh, vision library uh, for uh, helping us achieve that we came up with a nice algorithm we showed a proof concept and then uh, we went ahead and implemented that uh, machine so that was our very first project and then from there onwards that customer became a regular customer for us they kept giving us continuous projects uh, we always had business uh, with them after that uh, ganesh uh, subsequently did you develop any strategy for approaching the customers outside your contacts uh, yes so the outside the contacts the main uh, success we had was again uh, through national instruments 
because uh, National Instruments had set up their own office in India at that same time. And uh, they were a you know very large company. Uh, they were able to talk about the fact that they were like I think at that time we were maybe a three hundred million dollar company or something in that range, and uh, you know a very established company. So we were actually uh, a partner to them, right, a system integrator. So using that, uh, we were able to uh, approach companies like G Medical, Exide, uh, you know, totally unknown companies in my network, but uh, through National Instruments, I was able to. Uh, get introduced to all of them, and we got projects from uh, those companies at that time. So National Instruments became our, uh, you know, uh, key partner, our channel through which we were able to get pro projects. Uh, you know, after that initial phase. What's the difficulties for you to develop your first product? Mm, can you give us some details about that? Okay. So yeah, the very first. I, I can think of two things that are relevant, I feel. The very first project uh, was the one that I got from uh, my employer in Michigan, my past employer. And uh, so when I came, I had estimated that it will take me three months along with two additional engineers to finish it. But I was just uh, telling in one of my previous uh, responses that, you know, I, I was almost delayed by a whole month in, you know, getting my engineers. Uh, the two people who were supposed to join in January didn't show up, so it took me a month to find uh, other people. So we started only in February, and then it took us three months after that to deliver. So we were really rushing a lot uh, during that initial uh, project because we had to make up that one month. Uh, we never did make up that one month, by the way, but uh, we were working, I think, you know, uh, three of us, uh, we were kind of working uh, maybe about... 14 hours, 12 to 14 hours a day, uh, without even without breaks for uh, the weekend, and uh, there was a lot of excitement, of course, and uh, you know, to doing our first project, uh, we worked really hard and uh, got that project done. Uh, you know, really, uh, you know, did very good testing. I feel, and then we had a very successful installation in Michigan. Uh, so I feel uh, one important thing that came out of that project was. Uh, a work ethic that got set in that company among the initial people, right? That we were started off with a, uh, you know, uh, a workload that was very high, and uh, that kind of set the trend going forward also. So even, you know, as we get got future projects, uh, you know, that whole team that I worked with, including myself, we were all, you know, used to working long hours, and we didn't think twice about, you know, it became almost the norm for us in those initial years. We of course could not sustain that kind of uh, we, of course, we started taking breaks for the weekends, you know, after that project for sure. Uh, but uh, we had a very high, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, work ethic that got developed in that first project. I think the second one I can remember was when we were without projects and we were working on a product development. Uh, this was suggested to us by a consultant that, uh, you know, uh, that I came across who said, you know, the textile industry needs this particular, uh, te you know, uh, technology to, it was an en energy saving idea. He said, if you can develop a product for that, it will have a good uh, prospects. And uh, so he, uh, you know, gave us that uh, requirement. And then we spent about, I think a total of nine months to develop that product and then have it tested and all of that. And then we came into the market, uh, we got some very interesting, good uh, initial response from customers. But within four or five months after that, uh, okay, and, and as far as the pricing, the consultant told us how to price it. I thought, you know, the materials involved in making that product, uh, if it costed X, I thought, you know, 1.5 X will be sufficient to price the product. I thought, you know, we would have 50% margin. But he said, uh, you should make it at least 2 to 2.5 X. And I thought, you know, that is outrageously high and we were fleecing our customer and that kind of thoughts were going in my mind. Uh, but pretty soon I realized that, you know, I, by the time you finish your sales, uh, support, all of that, you know, that pricing looked adequate. But what happened is within five months, uh, we had two other companies who exactly copied what we had done because, you know, it was very hard to actually uh, hide or other, uh, you know, we were not able to really shield the, uh, what we were using. So they were able to copy it exactly, come into the market at much lower price. They priced it at around 1.5x. And uh, I went immediately to the concern and said, it's no longer possible for me to uh, keep this kind of pricing. He was getting a commission out of every sale. So 
he, it was in his interest also to make sure the price was high. But he told me confidently, do not lower the price. At most, you can lower it by another 10%, but do not lower it beyond that. Uh, you know, there's always a premium for the company who did the innovation. And if you can establish that you are a more credible company than the others in the market, you will have a customer base who will buy from you at the higher price because they want that assurance of a quality product. And I did not believe him, but you know, I anyway, I followed his advice because he had more experience in business. And just like he told me, you know, uh, while they got some of the business, we continued to be the market leaders. We continued at our higher pricing to uh, continue to get that uh, market uh, pricing. So I would say that was a very good lesson uh, in the early years uh, from those two experiences. One is about, you know, building the right wealth ethic initially. And the second one is about, you know, being able to uh, command premium pricing as long as you're able to uh, deliver, you know, better uh, product and service. So, Ganesh, do you see any difference in business cultures between US and India? Uh, yes, definitely there are differences, but I would say more and more, uh, at least the suppliers and companies who are working closely in the international, you know, working with international customers are very much adopting the, you know, the practices and culture of the uh, US, uh, US and, you know, uh, European companies, because it's almost, you know, required in order to, you know, be in business. But, uh, you know, my early experience was that, you know, in the company I was working in Michigan, uh, there used to be only one secretary who used to man the, you know, be at the reception, answer the phone calls, take care of lo most of the admin work for a company of size of 20 people, right? So I said, this is really good. I want to do the same thing in India. So when I came, uh, I said, you know, our uh, secretary who will, you know, manage the front desk, reception, the uh, phone calls and take care of all the admin work, right? And uh, so... Uh, what happened is that whole image or thing completely got you know destroyed when uh, you know we had to go and make our first uh, bill payment for some uh, service we were getting from the government i think either a telephone or like electricity bill or something like that so she went in the morning and didn't come back until you know uh, lunch time and so four hours went to just go and pay one bill right and uh, this is when i started to realize the difference between india and the west in, in, the, in the Western, in the US particularly, there's a lot of value to time, right? And everything works very, very efficiently. Whereas in India, we, you know, there is no uh, regard for people's time at all, particularly when you're looking at government services. Uh, everything takes four or five times as much time as it should. Not, not more than that, 10 times as much time as it should. So quickly, I had to, you know, start uh, calibrating my thinking to the realities of what was happening in India. So I think this idea of, you know, giving importance to time, uh, other people's time, giving importance to commitments about, you know, when you'll deliver something, those are the things that I feel are very much uh, absent in India. Uh, whereas I feel, you know, a lot of the mature uh, markets uh, like the US, uh, that is very well established because you cannot run a very efficient you know, ecosystem of companies if you don't, you know, meet your commitments. And uh, I think that's slowly happening. I would say definitely in India, that's also happening. But uh, that was one of the cultural aspects that I felt was uh, very different. And of course, the other aspect uh, that was very different was that in the US, the employee-employer relationship is, you know, there is no, not much of hierarchy there, right? Yes, the employer uh, does uh, continue to, you know, uh, have that, you know, uh, uh, yeah, they still have power to hire and fire, but, you know, it doesn't mean that the relationship and the communication is very deferential, meaning, uh, you know, you still interact as equals, right? But in India, uh, the d relationship between employer and employee uh, seems to have a lot of hierarchy. And uh, from the beginning, I have tried very uh, consciously to try and, you know, remove that hierarchy because I felt uh, if you remove that hierarchy is when you have... Uh, you can get more from your team and you will have a much more uh, involved uh, team and, uh, you know, their, your, your team members, your employees are going to recognize a lot of things that you will not see. And unless you had a very close relationship that was more like equals, they'll never come and tell you you're doing something wrong. Uh, you'll, they're no, you'll never hear some of the important things that are happening, right? And so I've tried to do that a lot. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Sriram, what you experienced 
uh, when you were here. But uh, definitely, Shiram was one of those people who understood that uh, what I was trying to do, and he was very open in his communication to me. Uh, and uh, I don't know how far I achieved with everybody, but definitely something that I tried uh, a lot to try and replicate the U.S. culture in India in terms of how people interact with each other in the company. Thank you, Ganesh. So I pretty much felt very comfortable, and I always felt that uh, we are equal when I was in Soliton. So you mean there is no hierarchy in USA, uh, but uh, yeah, as an Indian company, you have some operations in USA. Uh, so maybe, uh, do you have some difficulties at uh, Soliton? experience the new USA. Okay, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the good thing that happened there was, uh, you know, one of our engineers uh, went to the US to do his masters and when he graduated, I asked him whether he would start our subsidiary operations there. So, you know, the, the person I was interacting with at that time, he continues to run our subsidiary now. Uh, you know, I had a lot of trust in him. He was very young, but he, I felt, you know, he had that maturity uh, to be able to handle that uh, task and so it almost like was a continuation of a relationship that we already had when he was working in you know our India office uh, that you know when he went to the US uh, he was running the place and I was able to you know uh, kind of just continue the same relationship that we had at the beginning um, and since that time you know even till this day I have not hired anybody for our US office from within the US uh, we have still been able to move uh, senior people from our India office to go there and augment our U.S. Uh, office staff. Uh, you know, we've been growing our U.S. operations mainly from transferring our employees from India uh, who already had worked with us, you know, established that rapport, established confidence, uh, and, you know, then they are going there and uh, continuing that relationship. So in that sense, I have yet to experience, you know, hiring directly from the U.S. and, you know, uh, starting that uh, in a kind of like a fresh mode. Ganesh, if I remember it right, there was a toggle between the product and service-based definitions for uh, Soliton. So, are there any business reasons for that? Yeah. So, yeah, good question. So, when I started, if you recall, uh, Sriram, I was telling you that we wanted to build another HP or a Sony uh, type of company, right? So, and these companies, I saw them as product companies. Uh, although, if you look at IBM today, uh, they're really a very uh, a technology services company with a lot of their own IP, uh, but you know, if you look back, they're all product companies, right? So I said, you know, we have to get into products and that's how we should, you know, we can become a, you know, a company like these companies. So it took me almost six, five, six years before we made that step to start investing in products. And then of course we decided to go into cameras uh, and uh, you know, get into machine vision cameras. We were already doing machine vision projects using cameras from Sony and uh, a German company called Basler, uh, but when we decided that we will make our own cameras uh, and we thought there would be a market for that. So we started that and uh, we actually made, I would say, a successful uh, uh, camera because our camera, you know, once we made it, uh, we were able to, you know, install it in applications that where we had used Sony cameras in the past and in fact the subsequent orders, the customers specifically asked for our cameras because uh, you know, we are able to, you know, match performance and sometimes even exceed the performance of what the, our, uh, the imported cameras were uh, able to do. So that was actually a pretty uh, good, uh, you know, validation of what we were able to do technically. But I felt, you know, where we really, but over the years we never were able to uh, scale up the business. The sales were never picking up the way we wanted it to. And then after a while, you know, I really realized that, you know, the where we lack, where we are uh, really showing up uh, deficient was in our uh, sales and marketing uh, and, you know, rest of the operations. We were able to do the technical work, but the operations beyond that uh, was where I was, uh, you know, we were not able to do it. I, I felt that the, uh, that, uh, so when that recognition came, uh, you know, I started to really reflect uh, saying, you know, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, what are my strengths and where are my where is my passion where do i want to spend my time and i realized that uh, you know it was all on the technical work and i really was not very passionate about the you know the sales and marketing and uh, you know all the other aspects that really are needed to make a product successful 
and uh, somebody told me that the technical part of a product company the r&d portion is only 30% and 70% of making a successful product company is all the non technical work that really is you know uh, related to uh, sales marketing manufacturing operations uh, you know support a whole lot of other things so then you know i made the decision after you know in fact this realization came many many years later i almost spent 5 years before uh, i made this uh, second call saying that you know i feel that my strengths nor my passion is in there in all these other activities so why don't we in soliton uh, restrict ourselves to doing the product development doing the r&d and partner with other companies to take it to market right so that's the uh, change that came about and uh, so that's the strategy we've been following now uh, so recently we uh, you know we invested in developing a product and then we have now licensed it to manufacturing to another company who has been 25 years in that particular industry they know all the uh, customers very well and uh, they saw our product they were very impressed uh, and so now we are using doing this as our model we either develop the product in a full services mode for another company who has huge market reach or we invest and build the product and then we license it to such a company for manufacture and sale uh, marketing and sales and all of that so going forward that is the idea uh, that we continue to focus on the r&d side uh, either we do it in services mode or we you know when we see a very good idea that we want to invest on our own and own the ip we do it like that and then uh, take it to market through other companies so i don't see soliton becoming a product company in the future uh, but we want to be a technology company uh, with a lot of intellectual capital growing as we uh, you know build interesting technology Ganesh, uh, as an employer, how, uh, what do you think uh, that uh, your employees expect uh, from you? Okay, I think that's uh, probably a very good question. That uh, I think, yeah, I really feel it's a very good question and something that you know all employers, entrepreneurs should be reflecting a lot uh, about. And uh, you know, I would say that the first. things that come to my mind is uh, you know, i always place myself in the in the shoes of you know uh, you know an employer in soliton and i look at you know what would i want right and i typically use that as my uh, you know guide post on decision making so for me it is very important to me that my employer uh, maintains a very high level of integrity with me right that is i need to know what is going on i need to know what his plans are his or her plans are for the company for the uh, employers i don't want them want my employer to be doing anything uh, that could potentially you know uh, affect my future without keeping me in the loop right so i think that has been something that i felt very strongly about uh, that you know anything that happens to the company uh, i have felt that you know we need to keep everybody uh, informed uh, if there are any risks that i am seeing you know that i take it uh, you know i i am still ultimately responsible for the final decision uh, but i want to keep everybody informed and make sure that they know uh, you know what's happening right so the, the the high level of transparency which i feel i would like if i were an employee i i like i am always try to maintain as an employer right so that integrity and transparency is one the second aspect that i feel that is uh, i would say uh, it is been uh, on my mind more in the recent years is that what an employee really wants is also the the confidence that the leader of the company you know is going to take them to a better future right that is they are able to show the right leadership the right decision making uh, to ensure that you know we are going to go to a better future right to set that vision and uh, be able to actually go there and reach that uh, place so you know I, i used to think in the past that i had a lot of luxury because i don't have any uh, money invested in the company from external investors who are very impatient for returns right uh, who are coming and you know uh, telling me you have to do this or that to increase profits and things of that nature i felt i had a lot of luxury in uh, you know what i chose to do you know where where i invested and things like that but recently i feel uh, more uh, strongly that you know i am equally responsible and answerable to my employees right that uh, i have to show 
that we are getting to a better uh, future. And uh, you know, even though I don't have external investors, I feel you know I feel about employees in a similar manner that I am answerable to them. That you know, we are I am taking them to a better future. So I think that to be able to show that leadership, the right decision making. Uh, so that you know we are all moving into a better future is uh, you know the other thing that I feel uh, employees are looking for. And of course, I think the third aspect I would say is fairness. Uh, you know, every employee wants to make sure that they are treated fairly, uh, is treated with respect. And I think these are like you know the uh, you know I, what I would call um, basic uh, elements. You know, basic uh, uh, respect and dignity. Those kind of aspects and uh, fairness is something that I would say as a third uh, third aspect. Yeah. Ganesh, uh, I want to ask you: Was there any particular instance when you actually felt that uh, Soliton has uh, established itself in the market? Okay, I think yeah, there have been uh, events you know during our history where you know we felt very proud about what we had achieved. Uh, I would say. Uh, the very first one was when we received the uh, best application of the year award, you know, the global number one uh, award we received from National Instruments. And uh, we are a three-year-old company at that point. And I think, you know, that made us extremely proud and we felt like we had arrived in the scene, right? We were suddenly getting noticed, uh, you know, from an unknown company to a company which, you know, was recognized as... Uh, uh, as having won a very important award in the industry, uh, when we uh, when we won it for the second time, you know, equally, you know, we were uh, very thrilled about it, and that's when National Instruments actually invited us uh, to come and make a keynote presentation about Soliton uh, to the entire uh, Alliance member community. I think there were almost 300 odd uh, Alliance members at the time, and so on Alliance Day in uh, in the Austin conference. Uh, every year they select one company to make a presentation uh, and uh, they selected us in 2001 or 2002, I don't exactly recall. So I think that was another time when I really felt like, you know, uh, we had started off as just one of these 300 Alliance members and today we are being recognized, uh, you know, to come and uh, speak in front of this entire uh, crowd. I think that was another landmark event, I would say. I think uh, the other uh, times when I really felt very proud was, of course, when we made our first camera and had that working uh, installed there. Uh, and then uh, I would say, yeah, and every time we get, you know, really big, uh, important, good customer feedback, right? Uh, like uh, once, uh, uh, I think it was Texas Instruments who informed National Instruments that they rated Soliton as the number one lab view vendor in the world. Uh, in terms of capability and value. And this came through me through National Instruments and I felt very, very proud about that uh, when I heard that, uh, you know, that uh, news. I would say these were probably the points when I felt like that. So I would say the very first one was in the uh, year 2000, uh, August. Uh, you know, I, we started in January 98. So 2000 August when we won that award, I would say was the very first time that I felt like we had arrived. Thank you, Ganesh. So this was the instant when you felt that Soliton is uh, well known among the industry people. I want to know if there was an instant when you felt like Soliton had established itself in the market. That is, uh, it became really profitable. Ah, okay. That okay. On the financial side, uh, yes, I think the the first year was uh, you know just about we had a break-even performance. Uh, then the second year is when we started to see some traction with projects uh, with uh, some uh, company, particularly GE Medical started giving us work and at uh, that time, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were profitable, yes, but we were running out of cash and, uh, you know, the, this is a classic story of every company that goes through a growth phase. Uh, if you're still growing, suddenly growing, uh, you need more capital to fuel that growth, otherwise you will run out of cash. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you are aware that Dell, uh, at one point in their early history, almost went bankrupt, uh, whereas they were very profitable on paper, but they were growing so fast that they ran out of cash and uh, it almost, you know, brought down the company, uh, you know, without him being able to pay suppliers and uh, employees. Uh, so, uh, we never went to that kind of crisis situation, but I really felt very strained for cash in the second year. And uh, 
I went and met with a lot of venture capital uh, companies to try and see if we could get some venture funding. Uh, but none of them, you know, uh, responded because, you know, the field, the area we were in was not one of those uh, high growth areas, meaning we could not show 100% growth in a year, that type of thing. We were probably doing like, in fact, we were doing 60-70% uh, growth year on year for the first five years. So, but that was still not high enough for the venture capital company, so they didn't invest. So that time, I was a little concerned about, you know, funding it. Uh, but we eventually found some money by selling some family assets that came to our, uh, to my father's uh, possession. He had won a court case, which was running for many, many years. It was very timely, actually. It just came. So he won that case. The assets came and we immediately sold it. And we put that money into the company. Uh, I think without that... Uh, we may have been compromised on our growth. We would have, you know, had to say no to some projects. Uh, we would have uh, tried to get some bank loans, but we didn't have a lot of collateral to actually do that. Uh, so it was very timely that that money came. And then I would say after that, uh, we never had a situation when we uh, went into a cash crunch and we really had a problem. So I would say maybe in the third year, uh, we got to a comfortable position where we had the cash to fuel growth. We had enough profitability to keep going uh, and, uh, you know, since that time, uh, we did not have need for cash till, I would say, seven or eight years later when we started investing in products. Uh, we had a year where we our revenue dropped by 60% uh, because we took out a large part of our business which was not giving us profitability which, uh, and then we moved, uh, you know, a lot of that activity into our product development. So that time we again went into a situation where we needed cash and then I had an investor uh, who was a, a banker from London, uh, a known a friend actually. Uh, so he invested some money at the time which uh, allowed us to give, bridge that period also. And then since that time it's again been uh, you know, profitable and we didn't have any uh, financial uh, crisis or uh, challenging situations after that. Ganesh. Have you encountered some situation that you lose a very esteemed uh, customers from your company? And uh, uh, how did you uh, handle this, this kind of situation? Yeah, so this was actually uh, uh, the year 2004, 2003, 2004, when uh, we were about six, seven years old uh, as a company. Uh, at that time, our largest customer was G Medical uh, Systems. And uh, we were supplying, I think they were almost 60% of our company's business we were doing with that one customer. And uh, what happened is that the purchase department in GE Medical is known to be extremely aggressive in their negotiation. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've heard this from many other companies also. GE, in, you know, in general, uh, it's very difficult to keep high margins when you're working with them. Uh, because they really negotiate very hard, right? They give you a lot of volume, but they negotiate very hard. So this particular case, what happened is that that purchase officer uh, kept negotiating with us to keep pushing our rates down uh, year after year. Uh, so we made one, one time we made a, you know, a reduction. Uh, the second time when he asked for it, we said it's not possible. In fact, we want an increase because costs are going up. But he insisted that there are other companies willing to take over that business from us. Uh, if we did not reduce, we did not have any option at that point. We uh, we felt you know we had to reduce that year, so we reduced the business, the uh, the prices one more time, and then by the end of the year we realized we were not making any money from GE Medical, and uh, that time we made the decision that we would actually exit that customer. So rather than the customer saying no to us, we went and told the customer that uh, you know uh, we no longer. Um, you know, finding the business profitable. We are not even breaking even at these rates. And so we are going to exit uh, this, uh, you know, the account. And uh, we also felt responsible for ensuring continuing support for all the installations we had made. So uh, we found another company and transferred the entire business to them. And we worked out an arrangement where we told them that, you know, out of their profits may they make from this customer, a percentage would be given to us for this introduction. And we trained their engineers on all the systems for a period of one year. It was a big investment from Soliton, uh, and uh, but we felt we owed it to the customer because we, I had this feeling that we should be able to go to any customer in our past 
and they should always have good things to say about Soliton. And uh, so we felt, you know, we need to do a proper handover. So we invested one year of time uh, to hand over all those systems to this new company, train them on all of that, and then we exited that uh, company. So, so almost a company giving us 60% of our business, uh, you know, we exited uh, that one time. In fact, to this date, we have never had a customer walk out on us saying that we have not done well. So it's always, that's the only time we had a customer where we, we lost a customer, but it was more because of the way the purchase department was uh, negotiating with us. And uh, you know, after that, in hindsight, just, uh, you know, uh, since you are an entrepreneur, students studying entrepreneurship, uh, I, you know, in hindsight, I felt I should have done this a little differently. Uh, I should have probably, you know, we took this internal decision with just people in the company, uh, but I feel we should have had some senior experienced mentors uh, who could have advised us on what to do in this situation. I feel the right thing to do, to do would have been to go and ask for higher rates and even though we would have maybe gotten only a fraction of that business rather than walk out, uh, we should have just, you know, said that, uh, you know, give us this higher rate or we will not take that business. And uh, that would have been the right way to handle it rather than completely exiting that customer. Uh, so this was, you know, something that I felt I learned uh, later. Uh, yeah, but that's the one time when we managed to uh, drop 60% revenue and then, you know, it took us probably three more years to uh, catch up and then exceed. But by that time we had, we replaced all that with business that was much more profitable. So I feel in hindsight, it was a good decision overall uh, to make that transition. So Ganesh, uh, according to you, which is a better strategy for startups? Like, uh, should you directly reach the consumer or should you reach the industry? So. I want to know whether it should be a business to business kind of strategy or a business to consumer kind of strategy. Okay. Okay. I think I don't know if I am uh, well qualified to answer this from experience, but I can just share with you what my impressions are. Uh, today, you know, like somebody I, I heard uh, at a conference and I think this is very visible to all of us now. Today, you have very uh, smooth and very good channels to reach end customers like the uh, the most, uh, you know, visible example I would say is the App Store, right? Today you can write software and if the software is good, if your app is good, you have an ability to reach, you know, uh, all the customers uh, just as well as a large company, right? Of course, they may be spending a little more money on advertising online and stuff like that. But uh, word of mouth really can make, you know, a really good app uh, stand out. So I would say... In the past, reaching out to consumers would have meant a lot of advertisement and brand building. Uh, but today, I would say that the consumer market is also looking like a really good market for startups, particularly if you are using channels like the app stores, uh, whether it's Apple's or Google's and others. Uh, so that is one. And uh, I think the, yeah, uh, I would say on the, the you know the business to business is always a good. Uh, market for startups because unlike the consumer right the business to business is willing to give new brands a chance provided you're able to tell them that I'm going to be next door I'm going to be here with you I'll be supporting this uh, properly and if you can give them the conviction uh, they're willing to try out even startups so I think uh, I would say in general business to business is a good choice but uh, these new avenues through app stores and probably other things like that are also allowing consumers to become a good uh, you know, market for startups. So, uh, what do you see about the future of Soliton in 10 years later? Yes, okay. So, yes, there is a vision now, uh, which I think I, one of my previous responses I uh, kind of highlighted, that uh, I want to make transition Soliton into more of an R&D company. Uh, because, you know, what I see in the Indian market today is that there is a lack of uh, strong R&D organizations, right? Uh, if you look at what R&D is happening in India, most of the R&D in India is being done by multinational companies through their R&D centers in India, right? But if you look at domestic R&D, it is not even visible. Whether you talk about uh, government research institutions academic institutions uh, or Indian companies, manufacturing companies, uh, you don't have this really, you know, impressive uh, R&D 
organizations that are there. There are probably only a few, I would say, the Indian Space Research Organization is doing quite well. Uh, there are, uh, you know, very notable achievements. I think they are sending, a, they are having a Mars uh, mission uh, shortly. Uh, I think, you know, there are probably one handful of, you know, very visible good R&D organizations. But even there, people say that it's not as efficient as, you know, what is happening in uh, top R&D organizations. So what I want to do is, in the next 10 years, uh, I want to build the R&D capabilities in Soliton so that we become a nodal point right, for companies in India to bring problems so that we can do the R&D and solve it or we directly identify in the market, you know, what are the needs in the market? Is it clean water? Is it, uh, you know, uh, any, any type of uh, need that we recognize? We want to build technology, take it to a stage where we can do a proof of concept, do a technology demonstration and then tie up with an appropriate partner to take the technology into a product and into the market. So that is the vision I have. Uh, the, the big examples that I see are, you know, uh, I would say the most visible examples are institutions like MIT and Stanford. Uh, the number of companies that they have spun out of, spun out from there is just tremendous. Like, uh, uh, I think we, I think, you know, uh, those are like uh, what I call, I would say, the role models. Of course, they are academic institutions giving degrees to students. I want to see if we can do it without that, uh, you know, the academic part. Uh, I want to see if we can purely set up an R&D institution uh, that is there for people to come with technical problems. We should have a lot of experts there who will, you know, bring together, you know, multidisciplinary capabilities, solve it and, uh, you know, help those companies take it to market. And then we have a successful business through consulting, uh, IP licensing, uh, you know, those are the elements I see in terms of revenue uh, coming into uh, Soliton in the future. So if in 10 years we build a very strong brand uh, that is known, you know, throughout India and maybe even beyond India in terms of saying, you know, here is a world-class R&D institution that is making an impact in terms of, uh, you know, what products are getting done in India, I would say uh, I'd be very happy with that achievement. That's a good reason. I mean, you can do it in China if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I feel China is doing a much better, better job already uh, because I heard recently that in uh, Beijing University, uh, you know, we, are, we just finished yes. building a product for one Indian company. And uh, what we heard is that that same product has been done in Beijing University uh, almost one or two years back. Uh, and they have become now the world's leader uh, in terms of the technology uh, for that particular product. And they have licensed that technology to 20 companies in China. And all 20 are in the international market selling that particular product. And uh, so, uh, you know, I feel, you know, that is uh, really tremendous for China. And it's tremendous for Beijing University to, you know, bring together capability and, uh, you know, influence so much of you know, commercial product, productization of their uh, technology. And I feel, yeah, I think Beijing University is also, I would say, fa fast becoming a role model for us in India. <laughs> yeah, you are so good about the Chinese version. Um, I want to ask, uh, do you want to open a new subsidiary in China? That would be very interesting. Yeah, I mean, definitely see the one of the things that I've written down for what we should do as Soliton uh, to really make this vision true is that we should be collaborating uh, globally very actively because if we try and reinvent everything, uh, it just does not work. So I, I think we want to, you know, collaborate a lot with, uh, you know, people all over the world. And definitely uh, we'd really love to you know, yes, collaborate uh, with China also. So I think we can try and see if we can partner with somebody in China for the, uh, you know, to take the technology to market. That That is our model. Yes. Right? Yeah. Ganesh, uh, I think this is going to be the final question. Uh, can you share us uh, three phases during your journey which you found uh, was the hardest? Okay. So I think the, um, maybe the number one hardest one was when I lost uh, one of my partners. Uh, so uh, I think in the year 2000, uh, I, I was looking for uh, somebody else to join me because I was finding 
that uh, you know I was becoming the bottleneck for the growth of the company. There was more business than you know opportunities, and I really wanted to get uh, you know a very experienced partner to join me. And at that time, uh, I one of my uh, seniors from college. He is one year senior to me. Uh, he had already been in business for a few years, but not in technology. Yeah, he actually has a technology background. His degree is from technology, and he's a very strong engineer. Uh, but he was in the plastic industry along with his father, and uh, he actually uh, joined me uh, at that time. And uh, so we actually started off with some expectations with regard to how we will share the ownership of the company. And uh, after uh, through three, four years. Uh, what happened is i you know i felt like uh, the uh, the contributions of both of us uh, were not or rather we were not pulling uh, equally you know uh, the, the in terms of taking responsibility and ownership for the amount of activity in the company we were not pulling equally so i felt you know uh, to give 50% of the company to him would not be uh, correct and so i tried to talk to him saying that you know i see what you how much you want to handle and i feel for this uh, to handle this much i i'm totally fine and comfortable but i feel the ownership should be uh, proportional to what you want to handle and uh, he took a lot of exception to that because he felt like i uh, i went back on the word about you know going making the company almost 50 50 uh, uh, equal partnership uh, along the way and then so uh, you know very soon within a year Uh, we decided that we will actually part ways rather than because we were not able to come to an agreement on this matter uh, so when he left i actually uh, it affected me very very uh, much uh, because not only was he leaving we also had some uh, you know dispute to settle with regard to you know the the value of the shares that i would be buying back from him uh, so all of that actually created a lot of disruption for me uh, and for him of course uh but uh, you know i i felt that period when i went through it uh, you know just to give you a closure on that story uh, we decided to use an arbitrator uh, to actually you know uh, come to an agreement on the share value and then i bought all those shares from him at that value eventually uh, you know uh, taking a loan and all of that stuff uh, but uh, soon after that uh, it took me a long time i feel to really come back uh, in terms of my uh, my uh, uh emotionally i felt very drained at that stage uh the losing a partner having that particular dispute and conflict uh, getting you know that whole period of resolution uh, all of that kind of drained me it took me almost a year or two years after that to really kind of uh, get back to that mode that i was in the beginning when i started uh and i feel you know uh, i think different people handle it differently uh, for me uh you know it, it, it took uh, took a lot I, i would say that probably my number, biggest challenge that i faced during running the company uh, so far uh, the second one was i would say a difficult decision and a choice uh, but you know it became more and more evident to me that that is the right thing to do was this transition from products back into uh, saying you know we'll go back into services and become an r&d organization rather than uh, continue as a product organization i feel Uh, that decision uh, you know uh, coming to terms with that particular decision and saying that okay we are not going to be a company like a hp or a sony uh, but you know the to try and uh, look at maybe stanford or mit as our model uh, you know to make that transition i feel was again uh, took some time but by the time i made it and announced it in the company i felt very very sure about it and i had no uh, i did not have any regrets nor did i have any uh i did not feel like i was making a, a choice that was second best i felt you know uh, as enthusiastic and as passionate as you know my original uh, idea for what i wanted soliton to be uh, but that transition during that uncertain times uh, of what to do you know which way to pursue what are my strengths where are my passions understanding that i would say was my second uh, uh, challenge uh, again on a personal nature Uh, i think the third one i would point to uh, you know when we exited ge and we had this period when we lost a lot of revenue uh, went into a loss making year and then uh, you know trying to come out of that uh, i i would say that you know i found the capital soon enough that we were not you know very financially distressed but uh, i i definitely feel that during that period we also lost some people 
who were doing that particular type of work that we were doing with GE and others, uh, you know, they felt like when we closed that part of the business, they felt like their value, their work was undervalued, uh, and they did not want to make the shift into the new things we were doing. And when we, and when I lost uh, many of the engineers in that period, uh, you know, that too I would say is the third time, you know, that whole transition of one year uh, when I lost people and we went into loss for one year, that is probably a difficult period again. So I think these are the three stages when uh, I would point to as the challenging periods. Thanks a lot for spending time with us, Ganesh. Indeed, it was nice talking with you. It has given us a good insight about entrepreneurship. We learned how to execute idea from scratch and most importantly, keep a hold at hard faces. Soliton's growth in this uh, short duration is tremendous. We wish Soliton all the best to continue its success story and scale up in the future.